Good morning and uh, welcome to this week's edition of Tourismus Namibia, where we bring you topics and obviously give you new holiday ideas on the destination. And then, uh, last but not least, to the point, an interview. My name is Frank Steffen, as you can see on the screen there. Um, I welcome you to this show. I'm the editor of Allgemeine Zeitung and obviously also responsible for Tourismus Namibia. But first and foremost today, let's uh, carry on and bring you topics. Yeah, this week I've, uh, I'm doing it a bit different. Instead of having topics, I actually want to talk to you about a topic. And uh, in principle, it's all about uh, conservation. And uh, if you look at the photos that I've brought you here, um, these were photos that I made in, in November when I spent time up in Karum National Park, which is obviously part of the Kaza area spanning the whole of the northeastern part into Zambia and all our neighboring countries, in other words, Zimbabwe, Angola, and so on, Botswana included. Now, what, what was quite clear during that visit is that uh, there are many elephants, so much so that you might remember that uh, I spoke about it before. And look at this photo, you see uh, lots of small calves. And clearly there's something going on, and the guys are actually telling me they have a problem with, uh, with the elephants at the moment because they're sim simply too many. Now remember, this is November when the rains have not even started properly. And, and you can see these are huge herds within the question of 24 hours. We stopped counting after seeing 160 elephants up in Cardom. So uh, the, the issue that I want to bring to your attention here is conservation seems to work there. Now where it doesn't seem to work uh, so well is if you look at the, the line photos. And uh, if you look at this photo, it was taken in July 2020. And uh, clearly these lines are well fed. But then uh, the other day we spoke about it. Um, these lines are now in, in dire straits. And if you look at the, the next photos, these were the typical photos we had last year with a, with a drought carrying on for almost 10 years now. And uh, these lines are having a hard time. And what makes it worse is uh, we spoke to Isaac Smith of Delra. That's the Desert Line Human Relation Aids uh, Organization. This was a line that they actually finally were able to take onto Ankuse, um, who, who are still uh, keeping those lines for now. So if we look at those situations, clearly our conservation is not working as well as we would hope it to be. And the argument by Isaac Smith, for example, is that he feels that our, our CBNRM programs um, were uh, well established when they were established, and they were good for the time when they were established, but we need to revise them. We need to modernize them and keep them up to date with what's happening out there. And, and so when he says he's, he's against the CBNRM, it's not in principle, it's rather as we do it. Because he feels there should be a differentiation between responsibilities. So a farmer should not also be responsible for maintaining these lines or, or keeping them and deciding which one should be shot. In other words, doing sustainable hunting. Because what you typically find in the, in the drought that we experience up in the northwest for such a long time, the farmer sits with the catch-22. He needs more space for his, his goats and animals. So automatically he starts making space by giving more hunting uh, concessions for antelope. The moment he starts doing that, and especially also shooting zebra and all that sort of uh, animal, he, they automatically start taking the natural prey of these animals. And the result at the end of the day is that the lions have no choice but to start hunting normal livestock. Now, that, the predator has to live somehow, but now the people decide to shoot down a so-called problem line. But it's become a problem line because we've taken away too much food of theirs. And that's where, where, where we have a problem. So obviously then in November we had this, day, uh, we had this big article uh, which, which described the, the, the conflict uh, uh, that we have just described here. And then uh, the two journalists, Adam Cruz and Izzy Sassara, uh, they basically described the whole CBNRM project, uh, project as being a, a dead project. It doesn't function. So CBNRM obviously stands for Community-Based Nature Resource Management, and all those CBNRM programs fall under NAKSU. 
So what happened next was um, they shot it down, but it quickly turned out that if essentially they present, presented what they called a study and investigative report that found the environmental uh, program of Namibia to be a farce, and they summar summarily discounted all benefits that had previously been derived from the community-based nature resource management program. And um, so for them, that was done. And they called for a total ban on hunting. Now, in the process, they obviously do not respect the fact that um, the, the sustainable hunting is part of the exercise. So if we look at the next pictures, 2.1, I actually uh, wrote them down for, for Gabby. Gabby's doing our show today. So if we look at these maps here, you will see that the argument that they bring in in a, in a report in the Daily Maverick, they pointed out as one of the differences is here you've got the, in, uh, the income flow where you combine uh, income derived from what they term uh, phototourism and sustainable hunting. And if we look at the next picture, you will suddenly see how people start going into a loss situation, which is, uh, can be seen on the red uh, shading there. So what happens is if you exclude sustainable hunting, then these, uh, uh, all of these conservation projects basically die a natural death. And I think it's very important to, to explain that difference because it's a very simple thing that could be seen now at, uh, during the time of COVID. During the time of COVID, we suddenly didn't allow visitors anymore. So in other words, suddenly the whole stream of income from tourism, phototourism, dried up. And it caused farmers for the first time, or communal farmers, I should say, to sit there and actually compare their income that they previously had from tourism and from uh, sustainable hunting and compare it to their neighbor who's on a farm just as big as theirs, who does not believe in supporting that. And he still had a stable income, while the income that you have uh, from tourism and, and, and hunting totally dried up. And because nobody really came to, to assist, except there was quite a substantial support from the German government in that uh, regard through GIZ and a couple of others. Um, because of that support, these guys still believe in conservation. But how long will they stay there if, if we do not allow for additional income to come in? And that's where the next argument comes in. Because that person now wants to leave conservation because this one doesn't work out to him. For him now, the greener you see this 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 map here, the more that specific country invests relative to its income into environmental initiatives. In other words, in the upkeep of our wild animals. And what has basically happened is there's an article under uh, Science Direct which is titled "Relative Efforts of Countries to Conserve World Megafauna." And what they said is megafauna is basically those animals who take up the biggest part of your space. In other words, that are the most likely to be left out in the first instance once you let go of conservation. And what they argue is uh, they've, they've made an assessment of 152 countries and continents, obviously. And then they found uh, that it, they, they don't only argue in the case, they actually present this graph. And what they basically have found is that uh, while 70% of the African states exceed expectations in terms of input and contributions towards environment and conservation, Europe has only an average of 21%. Asia is something like 25%. North America, their central and North America is something like uh, 90% even. But what they're saying is 70% of them exceed what is average or above average. And so, the argument is quite simply that the sustainable hunting idea clearly works. Now, I know that this table dates back to 2017, but it, it strengthens not my argument, but that one of the, the Daily Maverick article, because they've basically taken those two uh, um, journalists to task, saying that, number one, it's shoddy work, and number two, it's incomplete, and they don't take the whole picture. And funny enough, the uh, organizations that they work for and to whom they, for whom they compile that report are all basically organizations that totally believe in not allowing hunting at all. And this is where my argument comes, and that's why I brought this long-winded argument about if it works for us, and if 70% of our efforts 
uh, show the right end result because let's face it, our, our numbers of game have improved since independence. Then who the heck are people from Europe to tell us what to do if they were not able to maintain their own level of game stock that they once had? So I'm not saying that everything that uh, Europe does is wrong, but what I'm saying is let us do our thing. It might not be perfect yet, and this is the big argument in the Daily Maverick arg argument, but it is something that works. And it can be improved on, as Isaac Smith has said, differentiate between authority and who decides to do what, so improve on the system. But don't come to us and say your system doesn't work. If th in over 30 years we've been able to actually make it work for a very long time. Our lines are in dire straits now, so we need to act fast. There's no argument about it, but at least we still have lines. Show me a single line in Europe. And there used to be lines there. So um, that is my topic for today, and it brings me to the end of topics because I don't want to bore you with these theories for much longer. Up next is destination. Right, welcome back. And uh, first and foremost, we start today with Nunda River Lodge. Now, if you look at the map here, um, it almost looks as if the Kavango is flowing from, from west to east. It actually isn't. If you looked at the bigger picture, you would see that it meanders from, from north going south towards the Botswana border. But this is where it basically almost makes a horseshoe. And uh, at the height of Popa Falls, which you see at the bottom, as you go up, uh, towards the middle there, you see Nunda River Lodge. So it's a very, very nice area. And uh, this is where lots of activities. And obviously, it's a combination of agriculture. Uh, you, you're close uh, to, to quite a number of parks, Bawata being just one of them, um, a Mahangul and uh, a National Park, and, and quite a number of areas which, which serve as, as a very nice visiting areas. So we looked at Nun Nanda River Lodge today, not Nanda, Nunda, I should say, sorry. There you can see the entrance. And uh, Nunda River Lodge is situated in the Kavango East region, uh, as you could see on the map, and is uh, what they call an experience seldom encountered in the Southern African continent, with its homely, relaxed atmosphere enhanced with a true African wildlife experience. Now, um, Nunda, the local uh, Timbukushu name given to the fruit of the jackalberry tree, is situated on the river banks, and uh, it's part of the Hambukushu tribe. Uh, which is but one of five tribes in the Okavango area. And uh, so it's centrally situated as a situation itself, as, uh, you know, as a destination in itself, as you could see there. So what they reckon on the internet side is you, you should spend at least two days or more exploring the region before traveling on to the Okavango Delta or the Atosha Pans, depending on which direction you obviously go, or for that matter, Zambia or Victoria Falls. So it, it provides for excellent birding and uh, wildlife, obviously, coupled with great fishing opportunities. So there's lots to do. You can visit one of the parks and do whatever you do. Now, Kenya Kambove, my uh, colleague from up in Rundu, he actually drove out there, and he also prepared a video which we will show you next. Mr. Cameron, can you just introduce yourself to our viewers? Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, uh, Kenya. Yes, uh, this is uh, we're on the Okavango River and uh, in a little village called Divundu. And uh, this is not our hometown. Our hometown is originally Swakopmund and Walfus Bay. And I was involved in the fishing industry for many, many years. And uh, there was always an inclination uh, from my side to come to the bush. I've always liked the bush. I spent many years in Zimbabwe and uh, traveled through Zambia, lots of countries. And I've always liked the bush area. So it was... Uh, Many, many years ago, in 2000, uh, I was doing a, 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 a safari in Botswana with my colleague and uh, he was retiring and we wondered what to do with our retirement. And we didn't see ourselves retiring in Sokopmund or Wolfus Bay. And 
the idea came up about trying to get a lodge or maybe go into tourism. Now, I'm not a, a tourist person. I'm, uh, my training is as an accountant and my colleague is an engineer, so we knew nothing about tourism. So the, the idea was born in Botswana and then we started uh, working out where, where we could do, what could we do, how would we get into tourism. And I joined up with a company called Wilderness Safaris and I worked near the Atosha Pan for many years. Whilst my colleague and his wife, uh, they traveled Africa all the way up to Ethiopia and back. They tried, they did the trip twice in order to try and find a suitable place where we could build a lodge. And it was after the second trip when they stopped here in this area that uh, the ground, there was ground available, which is which we have at the moment. And it became a negotiation with, with the, the owners of the land and then to the headman and then eventually to the, to the fumu and eventually with the Ministry of Lands and Resettlement and we were allocated this piece of ground. And we started building in 2006 on this piece of property that we are in at the moment. It's about five hectares on the river and we are very close to the Popo Falls. It took us um, about two years to get the main building sorted out and the campsites. And we also built, put up some tents, a big, not camping tents, but big Meru tents, <coughs> excuse me, with ensuite bathroom and a deck overlooking the river. Very beautiful. And uh, once that had been uh, established, we, we actually opened the lodge in May 2008. And then every year after that, we started building bungalows further up the river. So now we have uh, uh, 18 rooms. We can take 36 people and we have nine campsites. And we've opted to leave it that size because it does get too big, maybe impersonal. And that's not what, what we want to do. We want to keep our lodge small, intimate, and we like to, to know our guests. And uh, we make a point of making it very friendly, uh, a pleasant place to be, and not like a big hotel or a big lodge. We've got a whole different concept of tourism than what a lot of other lodges offer. Okay. So. Uh, tell me, uh, who I'm sure now our viewers from all parts of the world are watching this. Give us some of the reasons why a viewer should travel from wherever they are right now to uh, Dibundu, uh, specifically here, this side of Bagani area, to Nunda and spend a day or two or a week or a month. Why should they come here? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's in a simple word, it's paradise. Okay. It's, it's wonderful. We have a beautiful area. Uh, we're on the Okavango River, as you can see behind me, the river flowing by. That is the main attraction. And we are very close to the Okavango Delta, and which makes us a very unique stopover is we have people coming from Etosha Pan, coming through this area. They sleep over here for two, three nights before they move on to the Victoria Falls. Or alternatively, when they go down, they come to us and they go into the Okavango Delta. So we at a very crossroads of, of a very touristic hub. And besides the river that we have, we have all the activities of the river, uh, Mekoro trips, we do boat cruises, we, uh, we have fishing trips, and we've got two very good game parks close by called the, uh, the from the Babatra National Park, which is split up into two areas at the, called the Buffalo Core Area and the uh, Mahango Core Area. And except for Rhino, you can get the four of the big five we can get here. And the parks are beautiful. They are really stunning parks, a uh, lot of wildlife, and you can have a wonderful experience in this area without having to travel very far from your, from your lodge. It is something unique and special. Nunda, as I said, we're on the river. It's beautiful. We have a 450 species of birds uh, in this area. So that it's a, it becomes a birding paradise. It's well worth it. The ambience that the lodge gives makes it really a relaxing place to be. And, uh, it's just, well, as I said in the beginning, it's paradise. Okay. Uh, uh, what activities uh, do you provide to your, your visitors, your clients? 
Okay, we have there's quite a few activities uh, available. Obviously, as I said, on the river, we do have fishing. We offer fishing, we offer boat cruises, we do Makoro trips. But then we also do game drives into the Mahango Park or the Buffalo Core area. Uh, very, very rewarding. We do cultural walks to a local village. Uh, and this is the real deal. It's not mm. a tourist village, it's the real village where guests, especially from overseas, can experience the, the, the Namibian people. Instead of just watching the beautiful trees and the birds and the, and the animals and things like that, we must get to, they must get to know our cultural part of it as well. And because of uh, the birding aspect of it all, we also do birding walks and birding cruises. Mm. And it's very, very rewarding for, for the keen birders in this area. Okay. Uh, it, would, it would be a crime if I don't put this question in, in terms of how the COVID-19 pandemic affected the tourism industry, more particularly Nunda. How were you affected and how, do you, how did you manage to pull through as things are subsiding now? That was very painful. And uh, like all other instances, all other lodges and businesses uh, in Namibia and throughout the world, uh, we were not spared from COVID. COVID really uh, damaged us very badly. Um, it was a challenge to, to, to get this far. It's, we're almost two, two years down the line and we're not out of the, the jungle yet. We are still struggling. We had to cut back on many, many expenses. We had to cut back on insurances. We had to cut back on all unnecessary expenditure, all capital expenditure on revamping the lodge. We had to put on hold. Uh, we did not retrench staff. Uh, we tried to keep our staff, and up until today, we have not retrenched one person yet. We hopefully we will not have to do any retrenchments. But my staff, like ourselves, we had to take a cut in our salaries. In fact, I don't earn a salary anymore. Mm. Uh, my staff were cut back to under 50% in order to try and survive. We now up to 60% of their salaries, so we're not up to full, full speed yet. And we still have a few months of difficult time to go because January, February, March and April are traditionally quiet months. Uh, from May, providing there's no new COVID uh, and new, new pandemics, we should be able to see it through. But it's still going to be tough for another three or four months before we start seeing any improvement. Um, for the first time ever, uh, we've had to go approach our bankers and we've had to ask for finance to try and see us through, uh, which they've graciously helped us. And we just hope they will still graciously help us for the next couple of months as well. So it's not been easy on, on any of us. It's been a tough time. Mr. Kimura, thank you for your time. And uh, it was a great time spending with you. And we hope to keep this relationship going. On. Thank you for being our, one of our first guests on Tourism Show for the year. Thank you very much, Keith. It's been a pleasure. Okay, Thank sir. you. Bye. Right, and so next up we've got Hanas. Now, many of you will remember that uh, we spoke about Hanas in, in December, and that was part of the route that I uh, introduced, which I still believe is a very nice route, to, going from Khubabis up to Dreamyopsis. Uh, Dreamyopsis is that center uh, uh, yellow line that you see going up to Ipukiru and on to Oshinene. Um, but instead of going that way, you basically turn off uh, and um, don't follow the C22, but you, at Dreamyopsis, you turn right and go towards Hanas, which you can see there in the center. It's just below Ipukiru post 3. It's not far there. But anyway, so um, that, that to me is important to just point out again because HANAS has in the meantime become part of uh, Nkuse Conservation Organization. This is the entrance to, to HANAS and uh, you've got sort of, uh, I suppose it's about three or four kilometers up towards the camp. Very nice drive and um, as you go up, you will uh, then, um, if you're lucky, even see a line already or something to that extent. Be it as it may, as you come to the lodge, this is the sign that greets you. You still need to respect the animals that are around there. And uh, obviously, um, last time I gave you a bit of a background. This is typically the seating area where you can have a seat, but most people spend their time at the bar or outside on the lawn or whatever. This is where we stayed. Um, very nice bungalows. Uh, 
simple but actually very elegant. I, I, I very much enjoyed my stay. And then we obviously went and had a look at the cheetahs. We have Sasari here. Sasari has another brother, Sasa. So Sasa has got his short tail, which was beaten off by the mongoose. Because when they were young, they used to play with the mongoose. So we are not sure if it was really playing or if they actually targeted it to beat off the tail. Marking his territory. Good here. Uh. Don't, don't, don't. <laughs> no biting, no biting. Come on, come on. Don't bite, don't bite. I'll bite that. I was actually cutting meat and now my smell my hands smell like you don't give oh. me that. feed them. Oh, come on. Yes, those mongoose are a great experience, and I, I tell you, I actually enjoyed it. This is now obviously a photo of the, the uh, as you leave. Um, but, you know, the thing is, Harness Wildlife Foundation uh, was originally established uh, for the protection of animals, uh, but has since grown far beyond that. So they include welfare projects and nature conservation projects. And visitors to Harness can enjoy both quality and comfortable accommodation. Uh, while a range of programs are obviously obvious, uh, offered to you. You, you, you can enjoy game drives, you can go for line feeds and whatever. And as you move around there, you, you get to meet quite a lot of these volunteers that, that uh, assist th those people to do their job. So it's a very, very nice uh, experience and it's a great opportunity to get to know and understand how the system works. Um, because I know that there are quite a number of critics about, yes, but those are wild animals and, and, and. But if they're shot, then we all moan. So somewhere they've got to be kept, and this is a great place where they can spend time. You see ugh, anything from monkeys to, to, to cheetahs, as you saw there, mongoose by the dozen, and, and yeah, it's, uh, even turtles, whatever you, you have, it's there. And crocodile, even, if you remember the previous show I had. Anyway, so have a look at this short promotional video that we just included. Harnas Wildlife Foundation, a unique place, building on the legacy of the Funda Merva family and providing a safe haven for animals and the preservation of the ancient sun culture. Harnas Wildlife Foundation is a rehabilitation centre focusing on the rescue of animals. It all began in 1977 when the Funda Merva family pioneered the conservation of wildlife in Namibia. The story begins with Marita van der Merwe rescuing a vervet monkey. Marita's love for animals grew, as well as her sense of responsibility toward animal welfare. Harnas officially opened its doors to the public in 1993, allowing the world to become a part of an incredible wildlife adventure. Today, Harnas consists of a team of dedicated and passionate staff working together to fight for animal welfare and providing a second chance to animals that would otherwise have lost their lives. Volunteering and ecotourism serve as a crucial part of financing Harnas's vital projects. The staff go above and beyond to make sure that all visitors have so much more than a wildly unique experience. They make memories that will last a lifetime. The rehabilitation area spans over 10,000 hectares with minimal human interference to ensure the environment remains as natural as possible. In total, only 2,000 hectares are utilized by the farm area and the enclosures. 
The remaining 8,000 hectares consist of a fenced area called the Lifeline. The Lifeline serves as a release site, allowing wildlife to roam and hunt freely. It is the so-called final rehabilitation step, leading to potential full release. With the support of Namibia's marginalised sun people, also lying at the forefront of Harnas' ethos, a vibrant kindergarten called the Cheeky Cheetah School accommodates children aged three to six. Here they play and learn, a crucial stepping stone in being academically groomed for primary school. Haranas Wildlife Foundation, a place of unique experiences, a place of hope. Expect the unexpected. Right, and under our category to the point today, we've got a contribution by Yolanda Nell, and she spoke to wildlife photographer Roberto Kruer of Discover Namibia, and um, they're collaborating uh, with the Desert Lion Trust. So have a look at her contribution. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'm joined with Roberto Kruer, and he is from Discover Namibia. Roberto, thank you so much for your time. Quickly tell us what is Discover Namibia all about? Well, Discover Namibia is wildlife photography with the aim of raising awareness towards conservation efforts that are happening in Namibia. And when did you get into photography? I remember when I was about 11 years old. I had the opportunity to get either an MP3 player, when those things still existed, <laughs> or a camera. And I decided to go for a camera, but I didn't really realize that there was a bit of a passion developing there until I was about 15, 16 years old. I had the opportunity to go to the world famous Natasha National Park and I decided I'm going to take the family camera along with it. The rest is history. I just absolutely fell in love with the idea of taking photographs of animals in their natural habitat and just observing their behavior and capturing those moments. I just absolutely fell in love with them. And wildlife photography is one of those things where you sit at one spot for hours and hours and just wait. It's not like a person, you can't tell them to do a certain pose, you have to wait for the right moment and if you miss it, you miss it's it. gone. Yeah. What do you love about photography? It's such, an, it's such a unique opportunity to be able to create something. Um, whether you're doing photographing people, if you're doing something commercial, whether you're doing lifestyle, you've got this opportunity to almost encapsulate this special moment, whether it's the intimate moment with a leopard mom licking her cup on the side of her face, and it's such a unique, intimate moment, and capturing that, it's, it's, it's something so special. Where do you showcase your work? I have an Instagram account, obviously, as most people do Instagram and Facebook, but I also have a website um, where you can purchase some of my images as a fine art print. Um, what inspires you as a photographer? Specifically with wildlife, something that inspires me uh, with the conservation efforts as well. 15, 20 years from now, I'd love to go to a national park and I'd love to still see a rhino. I'd love to still see an elephant, I'd love to still see a cheetah and a lion. Um, unfortunately, at the moment, animals' numbers are deteriorating very fast. Um, these conservation efforts that are constantly working towards maintaining these animals' populations and their numbers. So, something that inspires me very much is constantly having to want to see these animals again. And obviously, that coupled with the love of photography and they found their way to each other very easily. Why specifically wildlife? Well, something something that 
I didn't consciously think of. Um, maybe since I was a kid, I, you'd find me watching National Geographic documentaries before I was watching cartoons. Um, it's one of those things that I've always loved nature. Run around the garden catching spiders and lizards, and it's, it's something that was, it wasn't a conscientious decision for me at all. Um, the love of photography developed later, and it was just a natural step that, that happened. I just, just enjoyed wildlife photography. Do you do other types of photography, like events or people? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I work for a social media agency called Nuka Nuka. So we do, I do a whole variety of photography. We do products, food, corporate, commercial, lifestyle, anything, any kind of photography that anyone would need, uh, we have to do that as well. And it's fascinating to know a simple Christmas gift decision has kind of laid out your, your career course for the rest of your life. Yeah. Precisely. And it's years later and you still enjoy it. I hope you yeah. still enjoy it. Definitely. I'm one of the few people that still gets to do what they enjoy. Yes, that is that is a privilege to be in a position like that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, but talking about conservation, you partnered with the Desert Lion Fund. Tell us about that collaboration. Namibia is home to many animal species that require conservation. I think, for example, we have things like rhinos, elephants, pangolins, cheetahs. All of these animals are in a position where their existence as a whole is facing serious challenges. Many Namibians may not know this, but for example, we have a, with the Desert Lion Trust Fund, there's a very small population of lions that live in Damarana, in the Namib Desert, in the middle of sand, there's nothing around there. And there's estimated to only be about 150 of them left in the wild. And these numbers are constantly deteriorating because most of the livelihood that people have that live in Damara land is livestock farming. So a lion in the desert, there's food that's easily available. What does the farmer do? Kills the lion because it's, it's his source of food and income as well. He needs to feed his family. So what the Desert Lion Trust does is they are working to establish infrastructure to minimize the human wildlife conflict. One example of those is, one example of that, is they set up predator-proof kraals. So they, they build a much stronger kraal that doesn't allow a lion to get into the kraal, which is crucial. They have GPS collars on the lions so that they can see where they are and warn farmers ahead of time if these lions are getting close to their farm. So. Collaborating with something, with a, an organization like the, the Desert Lion Trust is crucial just for the sake that there's only about 150 of them left. But except for, for safeguarding the animals, it's also important for those farmers to know, listen, the lion can't get into your car anymore. Please don't shoot. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I have to thank you so much. Um, Good luck with your endeavours. Thank you very much. Do you have any big plans for the year? Well, for the rest of this year, I have one main goal, and that is to try and make aware to most Namibians that supporting conservation is not a difficult task. We can do it in simple ways. Um, I don't want to use this platform at all to try and sell what I have, but the website that I have, 15% of all the profits goes to various conservation funds. So by doing something simple like decorating your home with a picture, an everyday Namibian citizen can be supporting conservation efforts yes. in the country. Yes. So. Well, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. And please go check out Discover Namibia on Instagram. His photos are fantastic. Thank you so much for the opportunity. <laughs> we'll be right back. Right. Uh, that was the contribution brought by Yolanda Nell. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Um, she said to me right from the start that the sound quality is a bit of a problem, but I hope you still enjoyed it. Uh, it brings us to the end of this show. Uh, thank you for joining me again on this Sunday, and I hope you still have a good rest of your Sunday and a good week ahead. Uh, so we see each other hopefully again next, time, next week, same time, same place. Until then, remain healthy and remember to get vaccinated. Bye.